Our next speaker is Lior Dadosh, and she's a senior software engineer in Cortex Expanse, which is part of Palo Alto Networks. Um, she has worked several uh, years on, on data related um, you know, technologies, and this is a very interesting talk. <coughs> they, they use um, big data technologies to analyze and understand the attack surface of, uh, of an enterprise. So um, welcome, Lior. Um, hi, everyone. I'm excited to talk about scaling public internet data collection with Apache Beam. So let's start. What are we going to talk about? First, I'll give you a little bit of introduction about the company I work for and the product that we're working on. Uh, I'll talk about how we are using Beam as, and why do we need a strong data infrastructure and why uh, we are using Beam to support it. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about our guidelines because we are heavy on Beam. We, uh, we want to, to have guidelines to follow and be efficient in our work. And then I'm going to talk about a performance tuning case that we did, how we applied the guidelines that we have to actually solve an issue. So um, just a little bit about myself. I've been working in the engineering and data field for the last 10 years. I'm a senior software engineer at Palo Alto Networks. And I'm based in New York. Uh, this is my little puppy hanging around Central Park. This is me hiking in the desert. And this is from my wedding that ha was last month. So <laughs> thank you. OK. So the product I'm working on called Cortex Expense. And this is a company that was founded a little bit over 10 years ago and was acquired by Palo Alto Networks, which is a big cybersecurity cyber company about three years ago. And what do we do then? The fields that we are working in called attack surface management. And the attack surface management is the boundary of your environment that someone can access and attack. Um, this is what we're focusing on. The process that we're doing uh, is described here. Um, and just to give you a little bit of history about it. So 10 to 20 years ago, it would be much easier because you had your data center and some applications running, and that's it. You control the situation pretty well. Today, with uh, remote workers and cloud, uh, you have a lot more to, that you need to monitor and control. And it became so easy to deploy applications to the cloud that it's easy to make mistakes. And the, uh, the last year, uh, we found that tech surface management product have discovered the over 90% of the issues are in the cloud. And this is the change in that area. Um, and the process we are doing to, uh, to help that is described here. We need to identify the vulnerabilities. We need to prioritize them, because we might find a lot. And we need to remediate the issue for our customer. OK. So we're all into data. Let's talk about the data that we have. So looking at, over these numbers, the internet might look big, and the IPv6 is changing the picture a bit more. But actually, if you're looking over the scanning te technologies that exist today, it became pretty easy to, uh, to scan the internet, and attackers can do it within a few hours, which means that you would want to do it too, and we're doing it. And when we're doing it, we need a strong data infrastructure to support the data that we are ingesting into our uh, environment. Um, so this is why we want to have strong, strong data infrastructure. We don't want it to be our bottleneck. Um, the data itself. So some examples. Um, we are scanning the internet, so we are observing services that are running out there. Um, so we can find databases, for example. And we need to collect data about who owns the assets that we are finding. So we'll go search who owns a domain, an IP, from public data information. And uh, now we have Beam at Expense, Palo Alto Networks. Uh, we all want to talk about Beam. Let's start. Some highlights for our usage in Beam. We process about 10 petabytes daily. Um, we have over uh, 200 pipelines that are running daily. We're using batch and streams pipeline. We are using the Dataflow runner. runner. We're running on the GCP environment. Um, we're developing in Java. 
and using the Java SDK. Uh, we're using Kubernetes to trigger and run the data flow jobs. And we're using Beam a lot in our daily, uh, day to day. So with that. Um, OK, so this slide just shows about uh, how heavy we are on Beam, what are we doing with it, and the general process about uh, data that we are collecting online, that we are collecting from the public internet, and the way it does until it goes to our customers. So first, we have some systems that we've built to collect the data, and the first store, the, the first stop for the data is the object storage of GCP, which is GCS. Uh, we'll ingest all the raw data that we're observing out there to GCS at first, um, first stop. Then we would have a lot of data flow uh, jobs um, that we're using, that wrapping beam. And what we're doing with those, we'll need to do cleaning to the data. Um, there's a lot of garbage in the internet, as you already know. And we want to do the cleaning. We're using Beam to do it. We want to transform the, um, the objects that we have to the formats that we're working with in the company. We want to do attribution, which means uh, that we have analysis and machine learning processes also with Beam to decide um, who owns the assets that we are observing on the internet. And we're doing enrichment with Beam because we want to bring the full image to our customer at the end of it. We're using some tools to do it. Um, you can see them here. We are writing to BigQuery as our key value store. And we have BigQuery for analysis that we are doing um, for our research department and for, and for our own debugging, too. Um, and then we're able to push the data into the customer's tenant. OK. So something that have been mentioned in the keynote speaker sessions too is that we want to use native operations if they exist. As developers today, we're lazy and we don't want to develop something that's already working and if it exists, we want to use it. So with that, uh, Beam has a lot of native provided pre-transforms that we can use um, and we want to try to use them before we're writing our, our own. But what about if it's not possible? We want to do something with more customizations to it. Then we would have um, the common library that we are exposing internally for our company. And because we have a lot of developers working with Beam, because, um, because it's a big part of our work, we want to, have, uh, we want, we want to, to be able to reuse code. We want to be able to expose it to other developers. Um, because we are working in all the company with the same objects, it makes sense that a lot of teams need to do the same and or very similar developments. So for example, because we're writing to Bigtable, we would write the data with uh, ptransform from the common library. We'll write a writer for the common library first, and then other people can use it too from the company. We'll, we'll also have a reader for it. And that makes our life easy. Let's say I'm in, I have an upstream pipeline that's writing to Bigtable, and, now, and I have a library to read it, that data that everyone's using. I can control, if let's say I'm changing the schema of the data, I can control the way that people are reading the data with that way. Um, so this is one of the examples of how it's helping us, not just with reusable code. OK. So as developers, we all love to test our codes, huh? Um, so writing tests. If we're looking over um, development without Beam, you would write unit tests. You would write end-to-end -end tests. And the idea is that you want to keep those guidelines when you're working with Beam. You want to test every ptransform operation by itself. And you also want to, to test your pipeline end-to-end, -end, the combination of the, the ptransforms that you have. So this is an example of, let's say, you have a word count, ptransform. Um, I know it's not a common example. It's very original. So let's say you have that transform, and you, <coughs> you want to test it. So you need to mock the input. You need to mock the output. And then you can uh, 
see if you are getting the expected output right. This might be more complicated if you have external dependencies. If you have external dependencies such as databases, you and might say uh, you would might want to use uh, Docker containers to mock your input and output, and this is what we are doing. Monitoring. Um, so first of all, Beam has uh, a native utility to use metrics, and we are using it to track our data quality and the size of the data that we are processing. The, the thing about data quality, so I have an example here. We want to count our empty lines. Um, so if you developed a data pipeline, you might know data quality is an issue. Um, and we want to be able to know that our data quality is good. We're using B metrics to, to measure it. And then you have the other side of it uh, that you want to also measure your SLAs. Uh, and that depends on your monitoring infra infrastructure and the way that you're running Beam. But you would want to track both of these things. So we have the data quality, data size, and runtime. So those are the main things to track. OK. Um, GCS right there. As, I'm, as I've said, we are using GCS, which is the Store, which is the object storage of GCP. And one of the things that we saw, uh, we have batch pipelines. And we have upstream pipelines and downstream pipelines to consume da data from them. Let's say you have a daily pipeline that's running with an SLA of 48 hours. And you have a downstream pipeline to consume th this data too. The upstream pipeline failed. And you want the downstream pipeline to be able to read the data. Uh, even if it's failed. It's a daily, let's say it's a daily, daily job, both of them, and they're reading by date. The downstream data is trying to access uh, June, uh, June 1st, and June 1st run failed. So we would have an issue, right? But the SLA is 48 hours, and we want the downstream pipelines to keep working, and that's fine. So one of the things that we are using, we're using a latest file to reference the uh, latest um, data version to consume. Uh, and that makes our life a bit easier and tr uh, with failures and other stuff. Um, this is an example of how we are actually exposing uh, the writer that we have. Because we are doing it a lot in the company, this pre-transform for operations of, operation of writing to GCS with the latest file would be exposed in our common library. A very similar but different example for streams pipelines. We are reading objects from the internet. Sometimes that would, that would, it would be big objects. And let's say if we're looking over an HTTP that we have, might be big. So working with, Kaf with Kafka, um, uh, it, might, it might be expensive. It could slow down your brokers if you have big messages. So we would use GCS as our external storage, and we will send the messages to Kafka as reference, references to the files that we have in GCS. Then our streaming pipelines would be able to get the data from Kafka and read it from GCS. And of course, we'll wrap all of this with uh, our common library too, because this is a common operation that we have too in the company. OK, so I'm going to tell you a little story about how we took the guidelines and actually solved an issue we had um, and used our common patterns to resolve the issue. Domain resolutions. Domain resolutions uh, are pairs of domain to an IP. It can be IPv6 or IPv4. It can be more, but let's just say it's IPv4 and IPv6. And we have a pipeline to uh, aggregate subdomains um, and clean, uh, cl clean some of the records. Because uh, we'll ingest most of what, what we're seeing, but then downstream, we we'll, would want to uh, minimize the data if we can. So we're doing aggregations, and we, we're doing cleaning. We're doing more with that pipeline, but let's say this is all we're, that we're doing. 
what happened with that pipeline? Um, scaling issues, uh, it happens. We got more data, our runtime increased, more records, uh, we paid more, and we understood that we need to do something. And uh, analyzing it, we saw that 75% of the cost were, uh, was due to shuffles. In a nutshell, what are shuffles? Traditionally speaking, we're talking about uh, data that moves between workers. Google has a data flow shuffle service that actually takes some of the work from the workers to a backend service that they've built. So in our case, we've used the shuffle service. And um, the shuffle service is moving data to that backend service that Google built, doing some uh, operations that require shuffle and sending the data back to the workers. Um, this is what we sp we've spent a lot of our money on. Beam coders. I will connect it all soon, I promise. Uh, coders are where you need to do um, serialization and then deserialization to your Java objects. So let's say you have a Java object, you have a P collection of it, and you're doing a P transform. You're doing a P transform over your P collections. You need to serialize and deserialize the data. Uh, you're doing it using Beam Coder. And there is a default one doing the work. And sometimes it's just insufficient. So Beam has some more native coders that you can use. I've put him here some of them. And in our specific case, uh, we had to write a custom coder that we'll go over, we'll go over and see what it is soon. Um, we tested some of Beam coders, and this was the most efficient for us. But I'm encouraging you to try all the coders. Um, and the idea is to minimize the data that you're serializing and ser deserializing. And with shuffles, data, the data that moves around need to be encoded and decoded. So this is what we try to minimize in order to minimize the cost of shuffles. OK. so. We've talked about domain resolutions. Domain resolutions, let's say, it's in our case, it's a bit more complicated, and we have a more nested object. But let's say it's just a domain name, which is string, and IP, which is also string. So we have two string properties. And in order to build a uh, custom coder for this class, this is what we'll have to do. We'll have to override two, method, two main methods. One is the way to encode the data. And one is the way to decode the data. So you can see with the encode method that what we're doing, we're just encoding the two properties, two bytes. And then with the decode uh, method, we will build the main resolutions uh, object again from the bytes that we have. So this is the main idea. Um, and because we had a big nested class, it really helped us to minimize the data that we are uh, serializing and deserializing. The results. Um, so we've got about 50% in the cost improvement in shuffles, which was great for us. And this is a very heavy pipeline that we have, so it saves us tens of thousand dollars a year. Um, and you can see we have here two metrics, and, and it's because the data flow runner for Beam has um, a discount over the first few terabytes that you're scanning. But so, so this number of total shuffle data and beable shuffle data will, would be a bit different. But the main idea is that we've got a 50% uh, improvement in the beable shuffle data that we had. So summarizing this process that we've just went through. We first were able to recognize there's an issue with our runtime and cost because of the monitoring infrastructure that we had. Then we developed a solution uh, ex and exposed it in our common library because the domain resolution, resolution object is something that is widely used in the company. We tested what we have de developed and we deployed it and kept tracking it with our monitoring infrastructure in case there is a future problem. We'll have this whole cycle again. That's it. Um, so if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. <laughs>